If you don't set your mind to do something, I don't think you're going to be successful. What's up, everybody? It's episode 62 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. John de Blasio. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, but most listeners know me better as the host of the show, and my name is Jeremy Lesniak. Whistlekick, if you don't know, makes the world's best sparring gear, as well as great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners and fans of the traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome the new listeners and thank all of our returning fans. If you're not familiar with our products, you should check out everything we make, like our wonderful headgear. If you're tired of stiff, uncomfortable sparring helmets, we have what you're looking for. Comfortable, durable, and still at a fair price. You can check out our headgear and the rest of what we offer at whistlekick.com. If you want to check out some of our other podcast episodes or see the show notes, those are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're over there, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. And uh, sometimes we send out discounts, hint, hint. But now, let's talk about today's episode. Here on episode 62, we're joined by Mr. John de Blasio, an Ishinu karate stylist who is a very accomplished actor. He's acted alongside such greats as Billy Blanks and Adam Sandler, and appeared in popular television series like The Sopranos and Sex in the City. I had a great time talking with Mr. de Blasio and really appreciated his insights. So without any further ado, Mr. de Blasio, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, Jeremy. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Thanks. It's, this is going to be a lot of fun. You're bringing a different dynamic than a lot of our guests bring in. And before we, we even jump into the first question, I want to let listeners know, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is that you have a bit of crossover. You're you're a martial artist, but you've also got quite a few acting credits. Um, you know, we're going to have a link to your IMDb profile up, and and it actually looks like you're you're doing even more acting stuff. It seems like you're ramping up that side of your career. Yeah, I'll tell you, it's uh, it, it's really in, in the past few years, it's really you know come to come to life, you know, with uh, everything going on in New York City, all the new TV shows, um, you know, I've been pretty lucky. I, I've been an actor and a stuntman. And, you know, like you said, the martial arts really helps that. Uh, right now, I am involved in a production uh, with uh, Robert Samuels. Uh, it's a movie called Beast. Uh, there's a big hype about it. And I uh, got the part as Aaron Statler in the movie. I'm also helping Bob as an executive producer. And this is a first for me. Uh, you know, as an actor and a stuntman, I've never really been a producer. But this is a uh, first time. And, you know, we're excited what's going on. We, we just actually got a confirmation from a, a another film company that they're on board with us so that's a big plus yeah that's exciting yeah yeah a lot of uh, a lot of big you know martial arts stars are starting to uh, come around and ask if uh, there's room <laughs> wow that's there there's nothing better than that and i can relate to that you know in doing this show of course at the beginning it was hey will you please come come on this show and now after over 60 episodes we have people coming to us saying C can i be on the show so it's it's a great feeling i can certainly relate to that but before we we really jump in start talking about your martial arts background and what gave you this this context to be able to step into acting in stunts i just want to throw out a few of the shows and the movies that you've been on that people may have heard of um just I, I picked a few. Okay. Um, little, little, couple little shows. Uh, Elementary, Blue Bloods, and The Sopranos. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. You know, <laughs> people might have heard of those. I mean, they've, they've been on you know a couple times. Uh, and then uh, you were in um, just a little over a year ago. Adam Sandler's The Cobbler. Yeah, and and uh, you know that was really something unique happened to me. On set, I met Method Man, and uh, I'm not a real and I'm not a real big, you know, rapper. And I actually was on set and this, uh, you know, 
other actor comes in and he's going to beat me up in in the film. And I'm like, okay, cool, everything. I get outside and everybody's outside and they're wanting to, you know, take pictures of this actor. And I'm like, who who is this guy? And it's like, that's Method Man. And then all of a sudden, everybody wants to take pictures of me because I'm standing with him. You know, it was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. I thought they were, you know, looking to take pictures of me, but it was actually Method Man. <laughs> um, fun story from from my world, completely unrelated to to the martial arts stuff that we have in common. I've seen Method Man in concert several times. I, I am a big fan of rap music going back to when I was a kid. And we had a... a good run of a several of several years where quite a few decent rap acts would come to Vermont and just you know little theater but for whatever reason they were coming here and one of the times that he was here I remember being in the crowd and him in the middle of this crowd standing up you know with probably 20 30 people holding his feet and I have never seen anyone and I bet you can relate to this in that moment that had more presence about him. Yeah, really, really, uh, really nice guy. But funny thing is, <clears throat> when we rehearsed the scene, he's supposed to uh, throw three or four punches at me. The first punch he throws, he hits me right in the face with uh, his ring. <laughs> oh, you know, an accident. He was all apologetic, sure. but I said, you get one. <laughs> that was it, one time. <laughs> But yeah, really, that, really, really sweet guy. And um, also on set that day was Redman. And, you know, we're outside talking and they, they started asking me about martial arts and fighting. And, and it was really, really a nice experience with them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Some, you know, definitely some great names out of, out of my childhood. And that's a lot of fun that you got to act in a movie with them. I'm definitely jealous. But Let's roll back. So in order to be a martial arts actor, you have to be a martial artist, or at least you should be, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you are a martial artist. So why don't you tell us, how did you get started in the martial arts? Okay, let me bore you with this story. <clears throat> uh, way back in the 60s, um, I got interested. Actually, there was a gentleman in my high school who was a substitute teacher. And he would come in, uh, substitute classes. And during the gym periods, he would be in the corner of the room doing whatever he was doing at the time. I was like, well, what is that? And he was doing karate on the side. So I kind of, you know, would go over to him every time and like kind of pick his brain what he was doing. And he said, yeah, you should go to classes. And then, uh, like everyone knows, Bruce Lee movie came out and that was I guess the real reason that I started martial arts like uh, all us young guys we all wanted to you know be like Bruce Lee and I went and met a gentleman by the name of Gary Alexander who stood about six foot five tough as nails and I sat in his uh, dojo uh, several times until finally he asked me, uh, are you just going to sit here or you want to take classes? And I said, yeah, I'd love to take classes. And the rest is history. I've, I've been with him as a friend and a, a sensei for 45 years. Uh, he teaches Ishunru. Um, i am got my ninth degree gone with uh, Gary Alexander also trained with several other martial artists throughout the 45 years. I hold a showdown with Bob Hurton from Patterson, New Jersey. I've worked with Mr. Austin, who was a Kung Fu um, instructor uh, in Elizabeth, New Jersey. I've met so many different great martial artists that, you know, through the years I've trained with Bob McHugh and Danny Lane, uh, you know, Joe Lewis, Michael D. Pasquale, uh, you know, it's just to name a few of them. And, you know, through, throughout the years, I worked and trained and learned, uh, which brings me to this point here, you know. 
uh, as far as the martial arts and the movies are concerned, you know, way back in the day when you would just get on a movie set and fight for free. Just the fact that you were there, you know, was was a dream. And everyone would always say, you'd never get into the Screen Actors Guild. It's too hard. You're never going to get there. You know, it's, you got to be in a movie to actually be in the Screen Actors Guild. But you have to be in the Screen Actors Guild to be in a movie. It was like a catch-22. And so I decided to go to acting school. And along with the acting school, I would get more and more extra roles. And, you know, you sit there forever in a little room waiting to be called to just walk by the camera. So that's called paying your dues. And everyone that sits in the room waits for the day that they would get three vouchers, which would make them SAG eligible. And then they pay their dues, they get into the Screen Actors Guild, and they go on from there. But I got it on the first first movie I was in. Wow. Now you talk about paying your dues, and it seems like you could draw some parallels between acting and the martial arts. I mean, you don't step up, you're not a black belt immediately, you're not in the Screen Actors Guild immediately. No. You've, you've got to You've got to throw 50,000 punches before you get to that point. You've got to do a lot of bit work, and I'm guessing low-pay, no-pay work Mm -hmm. before you can get there. Listen, it took me five years to get a show done with Gary Alexander. It it was, uh, you know, it was five years of going to the dojo every day. I think I was like a... Uh, ornament on his wall. I was there. I would help. I would would teach. Uh, you know, it, it was it was a love. It's, I think to be a good martial artist, you have to love what you're doing because who wants to go after school up to you know most of the schools I went to weren't huge schools. They were really small, and I think the the little small schools up on the the second floor somewhere in the back of a hallway were probably, you know, the schools that you learn the most in. No one saw what was going on. No one really knew what the martial arts were way back when. If you told somebody you were taking karate, they were like, whoa, you must be like a secret agent. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. You know. No, I believe you. I, mean, I believe you. Yeah. Not too many people were taking karate in those days. If, I'm going to give you a name that I don't know if you know. Or remember Jerome Mackey. I've heard the name. Well, it wasn't until Jerome Mackey, I feel that karate became more popular, or martial arts became more popular, because he opened up a chain of Jerome Mackey schools. Before that, there were just a school here or a school there. You know, it wasn't like a school on every every corner. Even when I opened up my own dojo. There wasn't a school on every corner. And, but if I remember well, Jerome Mackey was one of the first, you know, uh, karate instructors, I don't even know his, what his background was, that opened up a chain of schools. And now today, we have chain. you know, there are chains everywhere. Wow. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do some some research on him. That's, you know, it's a name that that rings a bell, but I I, I don't have enough context. So thank you for sharing that. So there's there's a good origin story for you. I mean, as as an actor, you know, you know, we've we've as the audience like to know, how did you get to where you are in this scene in this film that we're watching? So now we have a bit of context for you and what brought you here on the show today, but. I'm sure through all that time, I mean, 45 years of training and movies and training under great people. I mean, Gary Alexander, of course, is a name that a good chunk of our audience is, if not most of our audience, is going to recognize. But I'm sure you've got a lot of stories through all that time. So I'd like you to take a moment and think of your best one and give us that. My best martial arts story? Yeah. 
funny or serious? If if they're short enough, how about both? Okay, I'll give you I'll give you a funny one. Okay. Years ago, like I said, I was like an ornament up at Gary Alexander School, and he would ask myself and one of our other black belts, Tony Mattachini, to do demonstrations throughout the the town. And one one time he asked us to do a demonstration for a motorcycle group club, uh, if you want to call it that, a club. So we get there with a few of the other students. Gary Alexander wasn't there. And I look around and I said, Tony, I think this is the Hell's Angels. And we started to put on a demonstration. And no matter what we did, they would get closer and closer, louder and louder. And I kind of thought to myself and to Tony, we're not getting out of here. Soon they're going to start challenging us because it just seems like this ain't going the right way. So I was going to do some self-defense. So I asked anyone if they had a knife. I never saw so many knives come out. Everyone was just happy to offer us a knife. And I figured if we do it realistically, they might kind of like it. So we proceeded to do some self-defense with the knife. Everything was going pretty smooth. And then, boom, I get cut. All of a sudden, I, I felt like I was one of their, their club members. They were coming over. They were, you're a man, man, really cool, man. You, you know, you didn't even flinch. Yeah, man, let's get him, let's get him, get somebody, get him, you know, a band aid. Yeah. I was like, man, all it took was for me to get cut to survive this. And, it, it, you know, to me, that was funny because no matter what we did, nothing was working. So, you know, a cut on the hand for us to be accepted. And, uh, to me, that was, you know, I, I always remember that in the martial arts. And the thing that the one guy said was, wow, oh, you're really tough. You took that cut without even complaining. It's quite the compliment from someone of that ilk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what what happened next? What happened after the cut, after, you know, like they got you a bandage? Oh, uh, you know, so they... Somebody gave me something, I forget what it was, band is up. Uh, we bowed out and we sat talking with them. They they had a like a little, it was in a park where you could barbecue. They barbecued, we ate with them, and then we left. So it turned out to be a good experience, but it really seemed like it was going to be a bad experience. They weren't buying, you know, they weren't buying uh, what we were selling. Sure. After that, after that that point where clearly they they started to see you differently, do you think that changed their perspective on what you were demonstrating? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think the whole time they probably what it was was we had something that they didn't have. You know, they had their club and their bikes, but we had this skill, uh, you know, that takes a lot of time to acquire. And I think, I think when we demonstrated, you know, they, they saw that. And I guess, you know, like anything else, if, if you feel a little t intimidated by something that someone else is doing, you kind of shy back a little bit at first, yeah. but then you see something you like, and now you want, you, you want to accept. And I, I always found that in the martial arts, putting on a lot of demonstrations. A lot of times there would be other, you know, other martial artists in, in the crowd that were watching. And, you know, at first it's, well, you know, my martial arts better than your martial arts. I'm sure you've heard that or seen that, you know, throughout your, your, you know, years. Uh, but after a while, when someone actually does see something that is a little different than what they do, they sometimes, you know, accept that and say, you know, wow. I like that. I think I'm going to use that. 
And and that's what I've done throughout the years. Even though Hishan Ru was my background, all the other martial arts and all the other instructors and friends that I met through the martial arts had so much more to offer than just me learning one style. And and now today when I teach, I incorporate all those styles and all those memories and things that I learned from other people. And and I realized that no one martial art system is the answer. I agree. If there was one that truly was better than all the rest, we'd probably end up all doing that. Yeah, and you know, when people put titles to an already, uh, how could I put this, something that was there hundreds, thousands of years ago, and then people put their title on it today, you know, it, it doesn't change what it truly is, the, the true form of, of the art. You know, none of us really created any of what's here today. We just, like I said, took from several different arts in our mind and used what's best for us. Yeah, I agree. So what's that? What's the second story? Oh, the second that, story that is, is, yeah. is uh, I fought full contact for 10 years. And Gary Alexander uh, started this kick kickboxing league and, and I you know started it with him and I went around doing uh, like kickboxing demonstrations like three 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 minute rounds and we would go to different places and put on these kickboxing demonstrations so that you know he could promote these kickboxing uh, tournaments and I remember one time I was supposed to fight this guy three three minute rounds at the Pines Manor in Edison, New Jersey. And we get there, and uh, it's a boxing ring in a banquet hall. So when you put a boxing ring in a banquet hall, the ceiling is about three feet from your head. It, it makes it kind of crampy. Yeah. Yeah. So I get in there and I, I get in the ring to put on this demonstration. And Gary Alexander said, "Okay, gentlemen, we're going to have three minutes, three rounds of kickboxing." And I me. And I spin, kick, and kick the guy right in the head, and I knock him out. <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh man, I, you know, it wasn't supposed to be that. It was supposed to be a demonstration." <laughs> Yeah. So what happened? There's no one else to fight. So Gary Alexander says, well, Mr. de Blasio, I guess it's me and you. <laughs> so I spent the next nine minutes like uh, a pin cushion. And he proceeded to beat me back and forth, which I didn't mind. You know, th this is why I'm here, to learn, to get tough. And then, for some ungodly reason, I see an opening. And I throw a flying sidekick, and I knock him down. And he stands up, and I thought my life was over. And he goes... Well, if I'm going to get knocked down, it's going to be by one of my black belts. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm still alive. And <laughs> we bow out, go in the back room, getting changed down. Harry Alexander walks over to me, goes, this ain't over, mister. <laughs> so I knew where I was going to get the rest of my black and blues. It was going to be back in the dojo. I always thought that was, to me, that was funny that I made it through that day. Yeah, I mean, to, to go three-minute rounds with with someone of his caliber, especially as his student and 
you know, him knowing everything that you do probably just as well, if not better than you. What was the crowd's reaction to to you knocking that first guy out? Oh, so what, do you, what, what do you think? Everybody was like, cheer, you know, they were cheering. I, I wasn't cheering too much because I, I kind of thought, what are we going to do now? Because we're putting on an exhibition here. Yeah. You know, I was looking for anybody in the crowd. Anybody want to get up here? You know, not him, please, not him. He, he's a, a, I love him to death. He, he's one of the toughest martial artists that I've ever met. Yeah, yeah, he's, there are quite a few stories that I've read about him. He seems like an incredible martial artist and an incredible man. And and even at his late, you know, late stage now, he still trains every day. I, every time I speak to him, you know, he's out training somewhere. Um, you know, he's he's not not giving up. Not giving up. Good. Good. That's I'm sure he has a lot left to learn, but just as much if not more to teach. So it's good that he's out there setting an example and sharing with everyone. Maybe we can have him on the show someday. I'm sure he'd love it. Oh, that'd be great. Now let's let's roll back. Okay. Let's imagine you know you were I'm guessing you were a teenager when you got started if I'm doing the if I was hearing you properly and that that school teacher substitute school teacher I think you said. Yeah, I was either 16 or 17. Okay. So let's imagine you're back there, you're 16 years old, and that gentleman doesn't come to the school. You don't see martial arts up close, and you never start taking classes. How do you think your life would look now? I mean, you wouldn't have gotten into the martial arts. You may have gotten into acting, but in a very different way. Well, I'll be honest with you. Martial arts... That's a hard question because martial arts is like a part of my life. Uh, when I gave up my school, when I sold my school, the the thought was retire out of martial arts. And it took a, about five minutes for someone that I sold the school to at the time to say, why don't you stay on with us and teach? And it was a totally different system than what I was teaching. And it was like, okay. Because I thought, you know, I really thought, like, it, it didn't take much to, for me to not want to do this anymore. Um, so if I went back to 16, 17 years old, and I never took martial arts, and I'm talking to you on the phone today about something else. I don't know if I'd be in the same shape I'm in. I don't know if I would have met all the thousands and thousands of people that I met as a martial artist. Because I would go around not only demonstrations, not only working in schools, but I, I traveled a lot with Bob McEwen, Danny Lane, Bill Wallace, Joe Lewis, Michael D. Um, putting on demonstrations and, and seminars and meeting people. And I, I think I would miss all of that. I, I think I would be not less of a man, but I would have less experiences in my life. And I think that's what helped as an actor because meeting all the people and kind of watching. I'm, I'm a watcher. I like to watch people. A lot, a lot of people gave me, you know, ideas of how to act, you know, someone that was handicapped or someone who was slower or someone who, you know, bragged a lot or, you know, it just gave me ideas as an actor. Um, and it, it's rewarding. I, I mean, you're in the same predicament. You, you know, that experience of going somewhere and meeting a lot of people that want to learn from you. Um, I, I know myself, I like an audience. The more in the room, the more energetic I am. Uh, I'll do, uh, I'll, by the end of the, the seminar, I go sit in the hotel room and I'm 
exhausted and I'm aching now because, you know, I'm, I'm older, but I still have that drive. I still want to put on the same, uh, let's call it a show. I want to put on the same show that I put on 30 years ago. I know the body's a little, uh, you know, worn down, but the mind, and I think that's what the martial arts I would miss because keeps the mind really sharp. Yeah. Yeah. We've had quite a few guests on the show that are advanced age, you know, folks in, into their seventies and a uh, little bit beyond and well, their minds right there. Yeah, I mean, had, they can tell you, you had Bill, Bill Wallace on the show, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've known Bill for, I, I guess close to 40 years and he's the same guy. He was 40 years ago today, you know, same sharpness, same, you know, gets out there no matter what, no matter what he puts on that show for everyone, you know, keeps them energized, keeps them, you know, wanting to learn. And, and I think that that's what happens to us. It, it keeps our mind sharp. It does. And he's a perfect example of that, of not wanting to let that go because he, he doesn't have to. Maybe he's got to work a little bit harder to put on that same show, mm -hmm. but he's absolutely going to do it. And anyone that has taken one of his seminars knows that, especially people that have taken multiple seminars from him or, or you know, worked with him over, you know, let's say a 10 year span. You know, he's not quite what he was, but he's still more at 70 years old than I'm ever going to be. But the greatest thing is everybody knows his name. Yeah, you know it's it's so when he gets out on on the floor today, they know who he was, and I, I think that's that's really, you know, the legacy. You know, here's the man. It's just it's the man on on the floor today. They don't care if he can kick as high. They don't care if he can kick as fast. It's the fact that they're in that room with him and they're learning from him because knowledge yeah. doesn't change. A great, that's a great line. Knowledge doesn't change. You know, yeah, I like that. Our techniques get slower. Our, you know, kicks get lower. Our punches get slower. Not in my case. My punches are getting faster, but <laughs> absolutely. Um, but the knowledge, you always have that knowledge, and, and I think it gets sharper and sharper. You know, even if the fact that you're getting older, it gets sharper because. When I teach now, I understand what I've been teaching all my life. I understand it more, which makes me a better instructor. When you're younger and you're trying to teach, you, you just want to teach because, you know, you saw the instructor do it, so you mimic it. But as you get older and you stick with it, you understand. And I, I know everyone that's in the martial arts will understand this, but you understand what you're doing and it makes what you teach real yeah great points so let's shift a little bit and you know let's come back into a world where you know the real world where you have trained you do have all of these wonderful experiences that we just talked about mm -hmm. and I'd like you to think about a challenging time in your life and how your martial arts training or experience was able to help you with that time. Uh, let's see. Well, I, it's, it's more recent. About, oh, I'll give, I'll give it a year, 2008. Everything was going great. I was still, you know, in the, the dojo teaching, you know, still had students and, everything and I had a motorcycle accident. I broke my back. I tore my shoulder out of the socket, wrecked my knee, broke my ribs, laid in the hospital bed for a week, couldn't move, body burning, everything hurt, cried, uh, felt sorry for myself, wound up with a, um, what do you call them? a brace around my, my body, my upper body, 
so that I could stand up, wobbled like, you know, like I didn't have stability, uh, was brought to my son's house for two weeks, put me in, in, you know, in the living room, told me if I want to go to the bathroom, there it is. When I watch TV, no lying down, sit on this, this big rubber ball. If you want to take a shower, it's upstairs. I'm going to work. And I thought, what am I going to do here? And through, you know, the fact that I was a martial artist and I always pushed myself and, you know, always trained hard, it gave me the ability to get up, go take a shower, sit on the ball, gain my strength back. And I did it not because my son was trying not to help me. He was helping me by letting me help myself. And I stayed there for two weeks, got myself back on track. Uh, I spent a long time not being able to do martial arts. But every day that I couldn't do it, I would do it in my mind. And like I said, it really make, keeps that mind sharp because I went over all my techniques, kicks, punches, disarming, you know, edge weapon defense. Everything was going on in my mind until I was able to start training again. But that was, wow. that was, a, pretty, that was a pretty rough time. Yeah. How long would you say it was from the beginning of the rehabilitation to your ability to get back into the dojo and train physically? Well, let, let's, I'll be honest and then I'll be, tell you the truth. Honestly, about okay. a year went by that I couldn't really train. But every day I tried to train. I tried to do something. I, I tried to you know, throw a kick or throw a punch. And, and I think that actually sped up the recovery, but it takes a while to, you know, for things like your back and, you know, your shoulder to really get back to normal. Yeah. So let's just spend a minute and talk about that mental training, that training in your mind. You know, I don't know if you were doing kata in your mind too, you know, that was something that, that my original sensei had always encouraged us to do in class. You know, if you can't make it to the dojo, you know, if you're sick in bed, you know, you can always practice in your head. What did, tell us about that for someone that maybe hasn't trained in that way. All right. Well, here's the thing. I, and your, your instructor was correct. Going over in your mind your your katas or your forms or your pumses, whatever you know, whatever it's called. The, when when you learn those, you, you're not learning it to do a dance. You're learning it because in your mind you should be fighting. It's teaching you how to fight. It's teaching you turns, moves, blocks. It, it, it's really the basis of a lot of martial arts systems. I know uh, there's a, an organization, BKG, with Mr. Henry, who's passed. I've gone to that school. When they train, all they do in their school is forms. But by doing the forms over and over again, they're great fighters. So when you think about training in your mind, what you need to do is you have to have a reason why you start to think of what you, you're thinking about. I always think about self-defense. That's my, my specialty. I, I love teaching self-defense and, and, you know, that's what I do now. I, I teach semi-private two days a week. All my students are interested in self-defense. They're, they're no longer interested in uniforms, you know, the, the, the school type of, you know, setting. We come to my house. I have my certain students that come up. I train them in self-defense and I tell them the best way you're going to really understand this. Sometimes you have to close your eyes and you have to imagine 
what you want to do so that when you open your eyes, then you can do it. So training in the mind is is probably, I think, 75% of being able to do it in the street. Yet you have to have the mindset to stand in front of someone, to actually stand there when they throw a punch, to block and, and counter or, you know, block and, and, and put into a hold. I really feel that training in your mind is 75%. And then the other 25% is the physical. Yeah. But that's chi, well, you know, let's, you know, we can go philosophical chi and, you know, it's, it's all mind. It's all mind over, you know, all mind over matter. Yeah. It's a recurring theme. And I mean, so many martial arts movies, if we want to bring it back to that. Mm -hmm. and I, I think it's present in, in at least every traditional martial arts style I've ever engaged in, in in every school, you know, be it Korean or Japanese or Filipino, any of those schools, any of those styles that I've trained in, mm -hmm. it's always there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it's, it, you've got to, it's got to be, you know, you, you got to have a mindset of what you're going to do. And that's, that's in everything in life. If you don't set your mind to do something, I don't think you're going to be successful in it. It's a pretty powerful idea there. Yeah. If, if you don't, and we're starting to see more and more of that come out as, you know, we have people who are making their career, not so much in the martial arts, but as motivational speakers. And that's, that's a recurring theme for all of them. The, the power of the mind, the ability to, visualize what you want. I mean, whether you're, you're talking about, you know, something as, as old as, uh, the book, um, think and grow rich or, or the newer one, the secret or anything like that It all, it all threads back to the same thing. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, for sure. it's funny you mentioned the book, the secret, uh, and that's all based on, you know, law of attraction. Um, it is so true that what you want, if you think about it and put your mind to it, nobody's going to stop you from doing it. I, I, I mean, this is from my experience. You know, like I told you earlier, all I heard was, you're not going to get into the Screen Actors Guild. Boom. I get into the Screen Actors Guild. You're not going to be in a movie. Boom. I'm in the movie. I watch TV. Sopranos came on. I was like, wow, I'd like to be on that set. I'd love to work with those guys. And I did three times. Oh, I'd like to do this or I'd like to do that. And it just seems that when I put my mind to it, it happens. Yeah. So maybe I could run for print. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> well, um, it is an interesting political field we have now. So, uh, you know, I, I, I bet automatically if you threw your hat in the ring, just based on the 45 minutes or so that we've had right now, you would garner quite a few votes. <laughs> well, maybe, the, maybe the martial arts community. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. So you've, you've dropped some big names. You've had a chance to work with some pretty incredible people, but if we take out those people that, you know, you trained under directly, you know, Gary Alexander and, and some of those others. Who would you say was the most influential in your martial arts career? Most influential. Well, the answer would have to be the most influential is definitely Alexander because he gave me my start in the martial arts. Um, you know, honestly, he he's a, a he's a powerful, he's a giant in the martial arts and he gave me my my uh what what do i want to how do i want to say this i'm looking for a word my foundation in the martial arts and i don't think until i actually learned ishan ru and understood it that i could have 
you know, gone out to learn other martial arts and, you know, met other instructors. But other influential, you know, people that right now, you know, influence what I do, well, because I'm, you know, trying to break into the, you know, movie industry. People like uh, uh, Stratum, Jason. Yeah. Uh, Donnie Yen. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I admire their skill, uh, you know, on film. Um, you know, and I got to think about myself as a actor, martial arts, you know, action uh, actor. You know, got to got to please the you know the the crowd because you know if you don't you don't come over as a good martial artist or a good actor, you're not going to be doing too many movies. And I and I got I got to thank Bobby Samuels because uh, you know he's given me this opportunity to you know work with them in in Beast, and uh, I can't wait, you know. But, you know, yeah, why, don't you, go ahead. why don't you tell us a little bit about that movie? You know, it's we, we've it's it's come up a couple times, and I think it'd be a good opportunity for for us as the audience to hear. You know, what what's the the gist of the plot? When can we expect to see this come out? Okay, so I can plug it. Please okay, plug. Okay, let me plug it. Okay, so um, Bobby Samuels came to me with a script called Beast, and he he and and I actually did a movie years ago with Bobby. Uh, it was called Blazing. It was uh, Michael Wareham was the uh, the star and the producer of that film, and uh, we were kind of good friends then. And then we lost contact for a little while. And then I I went to the Action Urban Film Academy. The, I guess you've you've gone to those. I haven't been to that one, but I've okay. Well, been to a few of them. I, like I that. went to that, and and I kind of ran into Bobby again and, you know, it was like years went by and, and, you know, I met him again and he told me he was going to be working on this project beast that, you know, he, he, he and his, um, writer and, you know, um, there was two writers in beast and he said, uh, I'm going to send you the script. Take a look at it. So I read the script, gave him a call. I said, Bobby, I love it. He said, who would you like to play? I gave him a couple couple of names in the movie, and he said, well, listen, I want you to read it again, and I want you to read it for Aaron Statler. Aaron Statler is ex-CIA guy to go to. You need somebody killed, or you need money, or you need guns. I'm, I'm the guy to go to, but don't cross me because I'm the guy that could take care of you, you know, with a, with a finger snap. And the movie beast is about a chemical that's produced to make soldiers faster, stronger, impervious to pain. Uh, you know, their, their, their mind is clearer, you know, everything is faster. And so I get on board with this, gentleman Walden who has this chemical and he tells me that this is what he wants to do when in reality what he wants to do is he wants to build an army of beasts because the more they you take this chemical it has side effects and it turns you into a beast but the real reason that he wants this to happen is because he wants this army to fight actually against the u.s cliche you know movies yeah okay and uh in the movie well i can't tell you too much about it but that's basically the the uh the premise of you know the movie there's a lot of action in it there are a lot of good people tied to this movie uh, i'm not gonna tell you right now who they are uh, that that's something that Bobby Samuels, you know, has to release. But there are really some good martial artists that, that are tied to this film. And uh, sounds exciting. We we actually are now an international 
production because we just got a letter of commitment from Evo Films in Malaysia who just came on board with this this uh, film. Cool. When will it be out? Yeah. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the end of 2016. We start filming in June. So, with any luck, maybe there could be a release at the end of the year or the beginning of 2017. That's great. So we've got less than a year. So that's that's pretty exciting. So uh, do you know where you're going to be shooting? I would guess some of it's shot, going to be shot in Malaysia. And the rest of the film on the U.S. side, I believe, is we're shooting in Philadelphia. Okay. Now, that Fun. could always change. Been... That, always, sure. you know, that always changes. Uh, right. But as of right now, that that's what I understand. Awesome. Well, it's exciting, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of these these names that you can't talk about yet. And of course, that's always what people want to know is the things that they're not allowed to know. Well, but well, I, they can go they can go on Facebook. Okay. Uh, if they go on Facebook or they go on YouTube, uh, you know some some of the names I believe are you know released there. But I just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I I totally understand. Now, as a guy who's been in movies. I'm guessing you really enjoy movies, watching them? Oh, yeah. I watch them all the time. Okay. Do you have a favorite martial arts movie? Favorite martial arts movie of all times. Fist of Fury. Yeah. Was that your first Bruce Lee movie? No, you know, yeah, it was, the, it was one of the first Bruce Lee. I think it was The Big Boss was actually the first one. But what, was it your first one? For a lot of people, the first Bruce Lee movie that they saw really sticks with them. Yeah, I think it was The Big Boss. Okay. Where they would, um, that was the one where they were at the ice factory. Yep. And then there was Fist of Fury. Enter the Dragon was actually his first big break. Mm-hmm. Because I know he got ripped off on several TV shows. Yeah. Yeah, we've talked about it on the show before that he was intended to be the star of Kung Fu. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and it, everything, you know, we, we could have a whole hour talking about why that didn't happen. But, you know, if I go even further back, some of the first martial arts movies that I saw here in the U.S., was Duel of the Iron Fist. If you remember that one. I've heard of it. I don't know that I've actually seen it. I'm... And Five Fingers of Death. That one I know. I actually went to the drive-in movie theater in Union, New Jersey to see those. That the, They're both classics. I know that. Yeah. And Five Fingers of Death still pops up yep. time to time on television. Yeah. What, so what's do you your have a favorite? <sighs> it changes because through all of this, through the show, you know, I every every week, you know, we have more movies that people talk about, and and I'm out there trying to watch as many as I can, which of course isn't nearly all of them. But for me, it was it's probably still the original Karate Kid because. You know, I was born in 79, so that movie came out oh, okay. yeah. just a year after I started training when I was four. And so that movie came out in 84. I was five years old, mm. and it was the first thing in popular culture that validated what I was doing. Right, right. Yeah. You know, we didn't grow up with cable. My mom didn't bring me to the movies very often. So I didn't grow up, you know, I didn't see Enter the Dragon until I was in high school. Wow. But... Jeez. The karate, the original Karate Kid was on. I was flipping through the channels just a couple weeks ago, and it was on again. And it just, it still, for me at least, holds up. And I just, I can't. Well, it was the walk message. away from it's it. The message, you know. Yeah. And 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 the way they made the movie was to send out that message. You know, don't give up. Uh, and you know what? It's the original bullying bullying movie. Yep. Without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, God, boy, they had the biggest bullying campaign. They didn't even know about it 
you know, they didn't even think about it. The whole movie was about bullying. And and I think in schools today, they should show that film when they want to talk about bullying, because there it is. And, you know, he stood up to, you know, to the bullies and and he overcame. He sure did. (laughs) I'll give you one other favorite movie real quick. Yeah. And and it's recently, you know, just recently came out. Ip Man. Mm. I mean, such a great movie. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Donnie Yen. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's he he's the man of the moment, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There, there. You know, listen. Uh, one of my associates, Michael Wareham, is uh, working real close with Donnie Yen. Um, they just released here in the U.S. because it was released in China, The Monkey King. And uh, Donnie Yen is the Monkey King in uh, in the movie, and I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen it. Uh, it's ju- just released in the U.S. It's phenomenal. It's, you know, it's a fantasy, you know, uh, movie. And Donnie Yen just plays a, a fantastic role. I mean, there's nothing this man can't do. No, and everybody wants him in everything. I mean, it, we just uh put out something on our social media the other day that uh Jet Li dropped out of the new Triple X movie and they pulled Donnie Yen in to fill that role. Yeah, wow. And he and he's gonna be in the next Star Wars movie. Oh yeah. He's yeah. Huh? He is he is the the martial arts actor of the moment. I mean he's, and he's <coughs> tremendous. So I'm, I'm <coughs> cl- <coughs> sorry. I'm sorry. He is the second martial arts actor of the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Have you ever met him? Have I met? Uh, yeah, I've met. I've met for a very, very short time. Nothing to say, you know, I, I had any sit down time with him or anything like that. But I'm sure I'm going to probably meet him now that the Monkey King is coming to uh, the, you know, is now in the U.S. and, and uh, Michael is working on the trilogy. Uh, you know, the Monkey King, and I'm sure, hopefully, Donnie will be brought into that, and myself. Hey, awesome. So, we're going to have to stay in touch, because, of course, I would love to have him on the show. Cool. So, so I'm going to ask you, become become best friends with Donnie Yen, and then you and I can talk again, and maybe you can encourage him to come on the show. I would love it. <laughs> okay. Um. So let's start to wind down now. I mean, you've taken us on quite a ride. I mean, you have some absolutely amazing stories, which I knew that you would. But what's keeping you going? I mean, obviously, you know, we we can hear the passion in your voice for acting and that pursuing that is something that's keeping you moving forward. But how about as a martial artist? What keeps me going? Uh, Number one, I'm 63 years old. I want to wake up in the morning and feel like I have a purpose. Um, Still teaching makes me feel great that at this age, people still want to come and listen to me. Um, You know, that, that, that there, you know, really satisfies a lot. It, it, you know, keeps me uh, feeling like, you know, I have a purpose. People want to come here. They want to learn from me. Um, I, I guess, I guess, it's part of my life. I can't not train. It's like if I don't train, I feel like I'm cheating on myself. I don't know if you understand what you know what I'm trying to say. I do. It's something and you I sus- do every day, and it's like get up and don't brush your teeth. You know. You go outside and you're talking to people, you're going, oh, wow, I wonder if my breath stinks. You know, so if I stop training, I I wonder what's going to happen to me. You know, am I going to deteriorate? Am I not going to be able to move anymore? You know, so the, the training, even though sometimes it hurts, it just keeps you going. It just keeps you feeling, you know, good about yourself. Yeah, I agree. I completely understand, and I'm absolutely the same way. If I go too long without 
a good training session, I start to get frustrated and maybe a little difficult to be around. <laughs> so if people want to keep up on what's going on with you and the movies that you're doing, are you a social media guy at all? Uh, my have the opportunity social to follow media you? guy. I am probably uh, what you call a dinosaur when it comes to anything to be done on the computer or my phone. I answer it. I can send a text message. But that's about it. Okay. I have I have my wife to help me with all the all the stuff I you know need. It's it's so funny when I get a call for uh, an audition for you know TV show or a movie. It's right away, Terry. They need a headshot. They need my resume. Uh, I I got to do a self tape. Can can you help me with this? Can you put? And you know otherwise, I would have to be putting my headshot in an envelope in the mail and it's not going to get there for the next four days. And then I ask, you know, my chances of getting any jobs are, are shot. <laughs> so we, we owe, we owe some of your movies to your wife. So that's, that's yes. <laughs> good. Good. All right. So then what, what we can do is, you know, I'll make sure, you know, you and I'll stay in touch. And then as things happen with, with Beast or, or with other roles that you're in, we'll, we'll make sure we let everybody know about those. Yeah, I mean, if they went on Facebook, um, you know, if they want to um, friend me on Facebook, I usually, you know, answer people on Facebook. Okay, great. And so the way we always end, do you have any parting advice for the martial artists that are listening? Yeah, I always do. Let's see, we got another hour? Okay. Uh, <laughs> the only advice that I would give anyone in the martial arts or anyone that's planning on getting into the martial arts, choose the school, not by the size, not by how many students are there. Choose the school by what the instructor is teaching. It's got to be a fit for you. Um, I know a lot of people go to karate schools and, you know, they come to me, they talk to me and they go, my son's not learning anything. He keeps going up in the ranks, but I don't see anything different. It's probably because he's not connecting with the instructor. Uh, because, you know, martial arts are martial arts. Uh, a punch is, you know, a punch is a punch, a kick is a kick, a block is a block. It's how you interpret it. It's how you, you know, put it together. And, the person that's teaching the class has to excite you, has to, um, you know, keep you interested in, in what they're doing. Because if you're just on the mat because your mom or dad signed you up or you, you know, just go there, you know, because you got nothing else to do, you're not going to learn. You're not going to learn in, in the best, best environment. So I, I just say choose the school and choose the instructor that you feel you connect with and then you'll get the most out of, out of that, you know, that training. And if you're going to start to train, it doesn't come right away. It's not something that's your passion right away. It, it really grows on you. It, it, it's something that in my case, later on in life, I, I understand it now. Thank you for listening to episode 62 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Mr. de Blasio for your time. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes with links to the things we talked about today, including this wonderful photo I found of Mr. de Blasio and Method Man. We also have links to the upcoming movie Beast, as well as his acting resume. If you like the show, please subscribe or download one of the apps so you never miss out on a new episode. And if we could trouble you to leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts, we'd appreciate it. Remember, if we read yours on the air, just email us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you just want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that as well. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. And remember the products we make here, like our great headgear and a lot more, those are at whistlekick.com. So, until next time, 
train hard, smile, and have a great day. I wish I could have remembered one story I, sh- I sh- should have told you. Was I was in, I think, West Virginia or somewhere with Bill Wallace, Joe Lewis, Danny Lane, you know, Bob McHugh, and Michael. D- and we were all in the Longhorns eating, and we were throwing peanuts shells on the floor. And the guy, you know, started to complain. And I kind of, you know, real story, real short, I kind of went over. I said, do you realize well, who's at this, these tables? Don't, don't threaten anybody here because <laughs> you're going to get killed. Yeah, yeah. I had that same experience with, in a, in a, what do you call those? The, like the Chinese, uh, the gasho houses where they cook in front of you. Yeah. Somebody flipped uh, a shrimp and it landed on one of, uh, I think it was Wallace's, I think it was Wallace's wife's shirt and it, it stained it. And the guy with the, the sushi knife on the other table, because we were getting loud, was like waving the knife at us, like to stop, you know, because we were, we were making jokes. And I'm like, God, you don't realize what's at this table. Don't, don't go you know, putting a knife in front of people's face. You gotta be there. <laughs> you have to be there to, to really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. God. Hey, do you, do you mind if I chop this, that little bit out and put that into the episode? Cause that was fun. That story there. Sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah.